Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's having a great second day at Milken. I know that I am. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Caroline Fairchild. I am a managing editor on LinkedIn's global editorial team. We make sure that the news in your feed is not only insightful, but makes you a better professional. Um, we actually have a great conversation on the platform right now about this very conference, so you can follow along using hashtag MIGlobal. Um, there are more than 20 million men, women, and children around the world who have been forcibly displaced from their home countries. And as we consider topics like the future of work and our global economy, how we can leverage this talent has become an increasingly important topic, as all of my esteemed panelists know. Um, host countries are doing work with the private sector to try and assist these newly unsettled refugees, find jobs, help them leverage the skills that they have in their, from their home countries. Um, but some consistent challenges continue to persist. Um, on this panel with me today are the leaders that are working towards solutions in very different ways to the refugee crisis. And to introduce them briefly, we have Carrie Kennedy, who's the president of the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights, Jeff Maggioncalda, who's the CEO of Coursera, Gideon Maltz, is the executive director of the Tent Foundation, and Saeed Mujahed, Mujahed is the president of the Syrian Institute for Progress. Um, there are a lot of ways that we could take this conversation, but I think we're going to focus on three big buckets, which is what is the current state of the crisis, what are solutions that each of these leaders are working on, and then we really kind of want to open it up to a call to action of how the people in the room can get involved with, with some of the actions that they could be doing either in the private or public sector. Um, so to start, I'm going to ask Gideon from the Tent Foundation just to give us a general overview of where we stand with the refugee crisis right now. Sure, absolutely. Um, and thanks for, thanks for having me here today. Uh, I think there's three dimensions of the refugee crisis that are worth considering. The first is the sheer numbers. Uh, as you mentioned, more than 20 million refugees in the world today. Uh, that number continues to escalate. Uh, the greatest population of refugees are Syrian, but in the last year there's also been significant refugee flows from Burma, from South Sudan, from Venezuela. So the, the sheer numbers are continuing to increase. The second dimension is that when refugees are displaced, uh, about half of them are likely to, to be displaced for more than a generation, um, more than 20 years. Uh, and so we're not just looking at a short-term humanitarian set of needs, but actually a long-term economic integration uh, set of needs. And the third, is, the third dimension is uh, where this burden falls. Uh, for all the uh, press on issues in the US and Europe, almost 90% of refugees live in middle and lower income countries. Wow. Um, and there's about 10 countries in the developing world that host uh, almost 60% of the refugee population while having less than 3% of global GDP. Uh, and that's both unfair and, and probably unsustainable. And Saeed, can you speak more specifically to the Syrian refugee crisis? You know, it's the largest that we've experienced in our lifetime. Well, thank you. And I want to thank the Institute. I thank the audience for uh, being here in this session. Um, as you know, the Syrian refugee is the largest in our lifetime. And um, I don't believe uh, that, you know, the world were really ready for uh, this uh, flow of refugee in the millions. So I just want to quickly uh, say that we always talk about the refugee from the point of view is how we can handle it, how we can you know, prepare them, et cetera. But also we need just to emphasize just quickly that uh, how can we also uh, prevent, especially in the case of the Syrian refugee. So I, I always, in my personal opinion, I uh, think that the presence of uh, our uh, forces in the United States and also the allies will ensure to prevent uh, further flow of refugee and also perhaps might be the platform for the refugee, especially in Turkey, to return back. But going back to the refugee issue, uh, the Syrian refugee um, that, you know, everybody witnessed went, uh, you know, throughout Europe and some came to the United States. In the area of the U.S., really our government were not well prepared at all. So the, even the uh, uh, facilitating some financial aid doesn't even pay almost to the rent. So the Syrian-American community really took that burden uh, upon uh, itself. And our institute helped in multiple areas in training them, getting them the, you know, the basic things in life, driver license, uh, language uh, challenges, et cetera. So um, where we go from here is we really need, to, you know, as the panel here, we're going to address specific issues. But this, in general, is where I'm coming from in terms of our experience. And along the conversation, I will inject a uh, you know, specific uh, project that we are working on uh, supporting the uh, Syrian refugees. Great. 
Carrie, can you talk a little bit about what the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Organization is doing on this issue? So um, I just I think one of the issues that we really have to address as a country is why are there so many refugees and what's the U.S. role in creating refugee flows? So I'd like to talk about that both in Central America and um, and in the Middle East. So the Middle East. The United States has been engaged in an attempt at regime change in several countries over the last decade or so, which has resulted in massive displacement of people. So um, Syria, for instance, you know, we didn't like the regime there. We wanted our friend to be the head of state. And we went and started um, giving military help to a whole series of players who, uh, who want to overthrow Assad. One of those players turned into ISIS. So that, that's where ISIS came from. And that's what really fueled the war, which created the refugee flow, which made so much trouble throughout Europe and has, uh, and has destabilized other countries in the region. We did the same thing in Iran, excuse me, in Iraq. We did the same thing in Libya. And that's, you know, we have to accept uh, leaders where they are, who they are, and um, stop trying to create regime change because we think that will be helpful to us. That's in that part of the world. In Central America, we are now talking about building a wall and bringing people up to this and, and stopping flows of people to this country. Why are they coming here? Most of the people who are coming here are, who are actual refugees are coming here because they're fleeing violence in their countries. That violence happened because in the 1980s, the United States government um, bolstered uh, military regimes which were harming their own people. People came up to the United States. They were taken across our border, thrown into our jails, where they learned to um, where they joined gangs in order to su survive our prison system, went back down to Central America, created gangs there that then fueled the, uh, the drug rings that um, then were sending drugs up to the United States. We were accepting the drugs and then sending money and guns back down to Central America and fueling those, those gangs which then led to people being forcibly displaced and coming up here as refugees. And then our government says, we have to stop and stem that, that flow. Mm -hmm. So we have to take responsibility for the, um, for the violence that we have sent overseas. We just, sent, spent, uh, we just agreed with Saudi Arabia to give them $100 million worth of uh, of armaments. Wow. How about that? Mm -hmm. Where do you think that's going to go? And who do you think it's going to harm? And where are those people going to end up? Mm -hmm. They're all going to end up as refugees as well. So I think that that's, you know, that's part of right. what RFK human rights Right. And when we were just talking before the panel, we you, you said briefly that there are five things the refugees really need to be successful once they are displaced. Can you right. talk about that? Yes. Yeah. So they need, um, they need housing. They need health care. They need education. They need, if they come to the United States, they need English language training or the, mm -hmm. the language of the country they're going to, and they need jobs. And the, the main thing I think that, uh, I mean, one of the main things that people here at Milken can do is address the jobs issue, and right. I'd be happy to talk about some of the ways that can yeah. um, Jeff, why don't you jump in here now? Coursera is obviously a lot online learning platform that was launched in 2012, right? Mm -hmm. um, when did your company start tackling this issue? Well, it uh, so, so Coursera started in 2012. A couple Stanford professors were teaching a computer science course, and they thought, yeah, maybe other people not on campus would like to learn something about computer science. And the, te and the technology got to the point where they could stream this video over the internet. And more than 100,000 people came and they thought, maybe there's a real demand for higher education broadly around the world. So they created Coursera and they signed up Princeton and Michigan and Stanford and Penn as the first kind of founding uh, university partners. And they started authoring all these courses and making them available for free on Coursera. 
uh, and, and then that grew more people and then more universities joined and now we have 31 million people around the world. 78% of them are not from the United States and uh, we have 2,600 courses from 150 of the top universities. So it's all pretty much higher ed. And in 2016, so at Coursera, we have this little, twice a year, we do this thing called Makeathon. It's like a hackathon, except instead of just writing code, you could either write code or you could make something. And so there are people in our company who are really passionate about education. And, they, and, and one person was like, you know, I think that there's something about the way we're doing education. You could watch it on a mobile phone. You could do it without a school. Um, we should make this available to, to refugees because they're displaced and education is a big part of this. And so it was kind of a one-person effort to reach out to a number of, of institutions, uh, groups who are nonprofits who are s providing support and say, look, Coursera can be made available free to any of these nonprofits serving refugees. And so we now have over 40,000 enrollments on Coursera and wow. all these courses are available for free for anybody who works with our nonprofit partners who are serving re refugees. Mm -hmm. And speaking of education and learning, Said, we've spoken briefly about how many refugees are highly skilled, but it's, the, it's a credentialing problem in terms of that skill, those skills or that education may not be recognized in their new country. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. The most challenging things uh, that we experience in the refugee, it's not so much for lack of skills, but lack of language and also cultural barrier. Um, you know, they are coming from the Middle East. The life here is totally different, different system, different economic system. You know, for instance, here uh, you cannot start any business except to take a loan, whereas in Syria, everything done by cash. So that's really the most uh, challenging things. So what we do is we provide, first of all, the language and, and, you know, try to get them to the level where they can integrate in the society. There is a lot of social programs. Uh, you know, there are programs also we do through churches and mosques, etc. Um, now, we are looking for um, uh, getting a loan, which is, you know, like uh, a micro loan from the World Bank, where uh, we can provide an assistant to those specific skills that we interview. And uh, right now, we have uh, 3,000 Kuwaiti uh, students in Southern California that uh, they wanted to meet the refugee, which we did, and also with their consular, uh, they are from Kuwait. And uh, our next step is that they are going to do a fundraising so we can have enough fund to uh, kind of uh, help them out to prepare them to enter the market. And as now we, we go and we, we find out for particular people what businesses or skill they have and they need to launch their business, then we reach out also to the World Bank uh, to help them out, and that will create actually jobs. So that's really the positive spin on uh, how can we utilize the refugee coming here, not being burden on us, rather, you know, helping in the uh, economic uh, growth. Mm -hmm. And talk to us a little bit, Gideon, about how the Tent Foundation is tackling the five aspects that Carrie outlined for us. Sure. So our, our particular focus is um, uh, really trying to mobilize the business community to help refugees. We think uh, uh, that with the scale of the crisis and the fact that uh, it, is, it is a long-term displacement issue, the traditional actors of the UN, uh, governments, NGOs, can't handle this alone. We think the business community has a really vital role to play. And so we actually work with um, uh, businesses, uh, especially to try to push them to go beyond pure philanthropy, which, which is fine for short-term humanitarian mm -hmm. assistance, but for long-term economic integration, we don't think it's sufficient. We really try to uh, persuade companies to think about how to help refugees in three areas. Uh, one, through impact investing, uh, investing in refugee entrepreneurs, refugee-owned businesses. Uh, two, by uh, tailoring some of their commercial services and goods, um, actually very much in the way that uh, Coursera has or LinkedIn has mm -hmm. to actually better reach refugee populations. Uh, and three, in uh, hiring refugees and bringing refugees into the supply chains. Uh, and we think that is uh, a really important role for the business community. But could I actually just also just respond to a previous uh, yeah, comment just with respect to the U.S. government's role, just, just wearing a, a former hat as a, a diplomat in the Obama administration. I completely agree that uh, U.S. government's actions uh, have contributed to the refugee crisis from Iraq, uh, from Yemen and Central America. 
But I think in the context of Syria, it's a, it's a surprising analysis to say that the U.S. government, by doing too much, uh, contributed to refugee flows. I think if there's a criticism, it's that the U.S. government didn't do enough. Uh, and I think there's a lesson. It's that the U.S. government can create refugee flows both by, by interfering in, in uh, very unhelpful ways, but also by, by inaction. Mm. Thank you. Anything to add there, Gary? Um, well, I think we've both said our piece. <laughs> <laughs> Can, may, may, may I jump really quickly on yeah, this? Please. I, I don't want to turn it into politics here. at all. <laughs> but you know, I, I have a lot of passion when it comes to Syria. I'm, I'm originally from Damascus, <laughs> Syria. And um, you know, I lived all my life with the dictatorship that we can't even speak. They say wall has ears. That's how I grew up. So the reason I'm in the United States actually is truly coming to America to look for the enjoy the freedom, etc. So when the revolution started, it really started by a, a little boy wrote on the, on the, what do you call it, on the wall saying down with the regime, believe it or not, that's how it started. It was totally peaceful and they were uh, walking and marching against bullets and tanks. So it really did not start at all by the U.S. I, as a matter of fact, uh, Gideon really very much uh, true what he said, we Syrian American and Syrian at large, very disappointed from the Obama administration because they threw us, you know, under the bus. Uh, th what we've seen in Syria is the most uh, heinous crime uh, ever. I mean, used all type of weapons, chemical, etc. So I don't want to move further, but just wanted to kind of clarify, it's really a movement by the people, not by the U.S. trying to change the government. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so getting back to some of the solutions that are working, um, you know, Jeff, I think that what Coursera is doing is great. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you know online education can help not just migrants and refugees, but a lot of people with some of you know just upskilling and making sure that they have the right credentials to get the jobs that they want. Yeah, so I, I think that um, there's sort of a false dichotomy between on campus and online learning. It's starting to really uh, disappear because most kids, I don't know how many of you, I have a 21 and a 25 and a 27 year old, three daughters. And they're all kind of, they all went through the on-campus experience, but my youngest one, who's now at Duke, is taking classes online even as she's on campus. And so it's all going to blur together. And the, the level of instruction that you can get now online is incredible uh, and is getting better and better. And, and we have a version of Coursera that, that runs on a mobile phone. And um, we also made it so you can download all the courses when you're at a Wi-Fi hotspot, so you don't have to use up your data plan. But in Latin America and a lot of emerging economies, they take these courses on their phones, uh, which is an amazing sort of technology platform for the distribution of, of education. And in many ways, you look at countries like India, what they did with, with telecommunications, where they kind of leapfrog landlines, they went right to mobile. I think there is, at least for adult learning, I think kids, you know, they need people to touch them and to sing to them and to, you know, it's much more social. Um, I think for adult learning, increasingly, being able to use digital means, no matter where you are, um, will be a huge way to provide education. And, and, and when we think about education, we think about content, we think about learning experience, we think about competencies, like what do you learn, and then credentials, what, what proof do you have that you've learned it? And a lot of what I think we can be doing is enlisting people to create content, make it available through digital means, so it's much less expensive and it's available to people who are mm -hmm. not necessarily in one place all the time. And increasingly, I think it's gonna be people at work. You know, we talk about lifelong learning. People are not gonna stop work. So they're, I mean, by definition, they're gonna be learning at work and they're gonna be learning on, on digital devices. So I think digital is really important. I think having high quality education is important. I think having credentials is important. And on the one hand, we have, um, full degrees that are available on Coursera from University of London and from ASU and from University of Michigan. Uh, on, on the other hand, we had Google, we, we also have some corporate partners and I think this is, it gets to this question of how do you combine learning and earning together. Google decided that they didn't have enough IT professionals at Google. So they created a training program within Google to train people from all sorts of backgrounds. And IT is the kind of position that you can train for pretty easily. And they created a program where someone with no college education and no technical experience could become a qualified IT professional. There's 150,000 open positions in the US. There's 450,000 open IT positions in Latin America. Uh, so that, and globally, there's just a lot of open demand. So what they did is they brought their program to Coursera. They authored it with us for, it's an eight month program, costs $49 a month. You can start with no background, 
when you finish, you get certified, and we created hiring partnerships. So anyone who mm -hmm. finishes the Google IT certification program can be lined up with companies who want people with those skills, starting with Google, but includes Bank of America, Access Bank in India, uh, a number of financial services firms. And Google even decided through their philanthropy arm uh, that they will actually underwrite scholarships. So if you can't f afford $49 a month for the Google IT cert, they will actually pay for your certification. Mm -hmm. And then, sorry, I'll just go one step further, which is, we have a bachelor's in computer science that's gonna be coming from University of London. They are planning to extend credit for anyone who finishes the Google IT cert. And we also have a master's in computer science from University right. of Illinois, which is the number two program. You can imagine someone with no college experience, no money, and no technical background, starting with the Google IT cert, getting a job while they're in their job, starting a bachelor's in computer science, doing it all online, mm -hmm. finishing that, getting a master's degree in computer science, and, and essentially becoming a top level programmer starting from basically nothing. Right. Carrie, are there any other efforts from the pub, either the public or private sector that you feel like is really benefiting this problem right now? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, the refugee I issue is, uh, um, is, is great. I mean, refugees coming to the United States are terrific for people looking to hire yep. in the United States. So, um, Let's just talk about who the refugees are. Mm. The refugees who, the Syrian refugees who went to Germany, on average, had a higher uh, level of education than the average German. So, um, so that's kind of surprising to a lot of people. Most refugees who come to the United States have about 28% of them have a BA or higher, and that's about average with the United States as well. So I think we have to, you know, just to, in terms of people's understanding, there's, I think there's some confusion about mm. terms. So there's people who are seeking asylum, those are as, asylum seekers, and then there are refugees, and then there's another group that are migrants, and those are three different categories mm. of people. People who are, are refugees have had their, um, their uh, legal status um, clarify. Mm -hmm. So they're great people to hire because there's no question about their legal status. They're, they're allowed to work in our country. Um, a lot of them have higher degrees, which is great. And then those who don't are usually um, very, very willing to work in jobs that most Americans don't want. So uh, they're willing to work as farm workers, they're willing to work in meat packing industry, they're willing to work in lumber and in various parts of our country. And um, they, uh, one dollar invested in helping a refugee yields two dollars back within a five year period wow. in our country. Um, should I say something else? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the question is, why don't Americans want those jobs? And the reason Americans don't want those jobs anymore is because um, the decimation of unions in our country mm. over the last, so this is a little bit going off on a tangent, but um, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, white American men wanted those jobs. Like let's say the meatpacking industry, it was based in Chicago, it was that you got paid twenty dollars an hour thirty years ago, and they were uh, union jobs which were prestigious, and you got health care and a lot of other mm -hmm. benefits. Today, because those the the um, unions have been decimated, those jobs have moved out of Chicago in the, into the rural parts of our country, where it's almost impossible to uh, organize people. And so the wages have gone to down to minimum wage, so it's about $7 an hour for those jobs, and they don't have any of the benefits. The refugees are willing to take them. So that's not really a great economic engine for our country mm -hmm. into the future, but that's sort of the reality of why white American men won't take those jobs. Right. And Saeed, Carrie hit on some points you know, about how refugees are really good for local economies and the skills that they can bring to their new countries. What have you experienced in terms of your work um, with the Syrian refugee crisis? In terms of what, what are you seeing on the ground? Well, 
she's very right that uh, they are highly qualified in, in percentage from, edu uh, fr you know, from the education standpoint are much higher than any other <coughs> refugee that, uh, you know, uh, ever uh, may be registered. Uh, one, one thing to tell you, most of the refugee that went to Europe, they do have either, uh, I mean, smartphone, either Samsung or Apple. So I call on both companies actually to support them because they did, <laughs> you know, bu buy Apple and Samsung. And truly, <laughs> most refugee, can you imagine a refugee coming with a smartphone? Uh, that type of caliber that the Syrian uh, are in, in Europe and in the United States. Again, the problem is really cultural, um, how we integrate them. And that's really most of the emphasis on language and integration. Uh, now, we are also working within our community Whoever wants to hire particular skill, let's say an engineer or even uh, a uh, f like a, a company that work in furniture, for instance, you will, we, we try to bring those skills and work and find work within our community. However, the percentage right now is not adequate. So that's what I said earlier. We are trying to raise funds through uh, the, uh, the Kuwaiti student so we can build bigger infrastructure so we can have them integrate and apply for any regular company in the United States. The other uh, area that I found is uh, most Syrian that we have integrated with, uh, they are more driven into building their own business. They're not a uh, uh, type of just being an employee. Mm. So that's where we are trying to work, uh, reach out to the World Bank and bring a uh, loan and try to help them out how they can get into the financial systems. And there's really great skills that, can, that are bringing to the United States where we don't have. For instance, the uh, type of uh, uh, ancient uh, furniture that, you know, you, you know it in the Middle East, especially the Damascan uh, uh, type. Uh, I don't know if you guys, you know, uh, have any idea about the Damascan type of ancient uh, cultural that goes into uh, furnishing or the silk, etc. This is something really beautiful. And we have many workers that are here that can, you know, uh, bring to uh, that line to the United States. Uh, but as I, I mentioned, you know, we are in terms of an organization, uh, uh, small simply because the refugee crisis is only, you know, f uh, what, two years old that, you know, they came to the U.S. U.S. opened its door only in the last two, two and a half years. So we are right now building the infrastructure to try to facilitate that. But in the meantime, um, we have done uh, quite a bit uh, for the refugee that are in Southern California. It's not a large number, around 1,000. But now we have to expand it to the larger uh, uh, presence in the United States. Mm -hmm. And Gideon, talk a little bit about what the Ten Foundation is doing about that. Sure, can I actually just pick up on um, a point about refugee workers? Uh, just because I think I'm it's- sensing it's, a trend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, just because I think it's, uh, it's a point that really deserves emphasis. Uh, the companies that are in the Tent Partnership that have made commitments to hire refugees, uh, Starbucks, WeWorks, Giovanni, others, have had the most incredible experience with refugees. Uh, uh, these are people whose, whose lives have been destroyed at home, who come, who are really so eager, enthusiastic for a new opportunity, and who sees that with both hands. Uh, and, uh, these companies have told us that that the sort of uh, the the uh, motivation and hard work and loyalty that these refugees bring uh, really are, are are great for the company. And we actually have a, a study coming out in a couple of weeks with the Fiscal Policy Institute that looked at turnover rates between refugees and non-refugees and found uh, significantly lower turnover for refugees, um, which which creates obviously a very significant mm -hmm. uh, business dividend. And by the way, there's also all sorts of data showing that refugees repay loans uh, at much higher rates than non-refugees. Wow. So this this is a population that 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 with some support and investment actually does uh, uh, is actually good for the businesses that mm -hmm. uh, hire them, uh, lend to them, help them. Mm -hmm. So and just to pick up on that, so uh, Chobani, one out of every th three out of ten workers at Chobani are refugees, yeah. and Starbucks has committed to hiring ten thousand refugees in the next five years. Yeah. Is that yeah. ten yeah. or ten years? And we works is doing an extraordinary job. I mean, their emphasis is is really going to refugee. Their hiring practice for um, for new workers is to go to refugee agencies and say, these are our new um, positions. We would like you to fill them. So they're trying to fill as many 
new positions as possible ref with refugees. And you might have other examples, but. Yeah, and just to emphasize that, no, that's all correct. And WeWork's commitment is 1,500 refugees in the US and Europe. But in all of these cases, part of it's humanitarian, but part of it is business. WeWork yeah. hired 50 refugees, and the CEO had just had a very positive experience with, with how hard they worked, how long they stayed, and decided to hire a lot more. In, in the case of Jabani, Hamdi Ulakaya hired a cohort initially because he, he, needed, uh, he needed labor at the factories and found that they were they made for really productive workers. And so it's, it's been a mix of humanitarian and business reasons. And he was a refugee himself? <coughs> uh, Refugee-like, but uh, he, he came to the US <laughs> as an immigrant, but certainly has uh, strong sympathy for those yeah, in the refugee situation. And, and fleeing. He was fleeing when he uh, came. Maybe he doesn't talk about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Never mind. <laughs> so how do we change the narrative to be more inclusive of the picture that you guys are painting of the refugee and migrant community? I'm hearing a highly skilled workforce that is great to be employed, and really the, pub, the private sector should be thinking about this more holistically. How do we get more people talking about the issues like we're talking about them on, on this panel? I don't know who wants to take that. I can maybe uh, a little bit put emphasis on that. It's really important what you raised because uh, the media in general, especially when the flow of refugee uh, started two years ago into Europe, actually of course started far before that, but it was mostly localized between Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey. But the moment start going into Europe, we saw all this political um, platform change, and now we see in Europe people more are on the right side, you know, and speaking against the refugee, etc. The misperception that the world uh, or the media put the negative uh, 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 cover on the refugees scared the masses of the people and people start thinking those people are gonna take our jobs. Mm. So I think one of the solution is to look at the refugee in a positive terms because truly they have a lot to offer in many, many ways, not only skills but also cultural. I'll give you an example. Uh, I don't recall the country. I think maybe the Queen of, uh, or of Belgium, but don't quote me, but some, someone in, in those European country, uh, she hired a Syrian refugee to serve the food. So it was all food served by a Syrian. So I'm, I'm just giving you a sample of how the Syrian refugee uh, made it to the highest level of, of you know, what we all like to taste and yet been chosen by, by that particular queen of that country. So changing the image is really important. Why? Because then once the refugee are skilled enough in terms of the language and they're ready to enter the market, then the companies that they're going to hire them, uh, they will be more receptive and open to hire them. So my point to you is the, the, uh, the media play a major role in that, in changing the image and uh, present the true image of the refugee, that they are not a negative force on the uh, economy rather than can be a positive one. Mm -hmm. And just to add, I think uh, business leaders have, have a unique role in, in communicating this message. I think with, with so many, uh, the, the public has a such dim view of so many uh, of, the, of the key institutions in our society, whether it's politicians or media, but business leaders and, and uh, leaders who, le who lead strong brands mm -hmm. actually have a lot more credibility with the public, and when they step up and they make a decision to, to help refugees, it has, it has a very broad resonance. Starbucks making a commitment to hire refugees, obviously it's good for those refugees, but it sends a signal about the importance that that brand attaches to refugees that I think has much much broader sort of public and political resonance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, did you want to add something? Well, well, I would just say, I think, you know, there's, the, I sort of look at this in a couple of different ways. So one is what are local groups doing to help, which you're doing so well. And then what are the businesses doing to help, which Tent Foundation is, is really enhancing. And then what are, what's the role of, of government? And I think that um, the government role is in part allowing larger flows of refugees mm. to our country, you know, stopping this ridiculous Muslim ban um, that has been so harmful to refugees around the world and, and has been harmful to our country and to people who live and work here. Um, but then there's, there are larger things that we can do uh, globally. So we can increase, uh, for instance, um, uh, trade 
um, allow for, for better trade deals with countries that are taking refugees, um, which is important. We can do um, invest, investors can invest in uh, companies that help refugees mm -hmm. and in um, large pots of money that will go to countries that are taking in large numbers of refugees and things like that, which I think really um, uh, through impact investing schemes, and et cetera, can really make an enormous mm -hmm. difference. And Jeff, getting back to some of the education themes that Coursera is, is helping on, are we moving towards an education system where skills and degrees are going to be more universally recognized? Like, how are, where, where do you see that going in terms of maybe easing some of the transitions that migrants, refugees, you know, immigrants face when they move from country to country? Yeah, I, I, I often say that the future of learning and the future of work are converging because the world's moving so fast and technology is sort of metaphorically displacing a lot of people, economically displacing a lot of people. Even people who don't lose their home <coughs> are still in their country. They're, they're feeling very displaced. Mm. And there's a broad recognition. I mean, across this entire conference, uh, one of the underlying themes is education because to stay relevant and to stay uh, agile and ability, uh, able to adapt to change, becoming educated, partly getting skills, but partly just understand the context of what's happening is very important. The good news is that even though technology is displacing a lot of people, it's also creating the ability for people to get equal opportunity to the best education in the world. I mean, like literally the best education in the world from the best, best recognized institutions. And I think that there will be, m already there's much broader access. It's happening very rapidly. One of the reasons it's happening is because businesses are having a talent shortage and skills shortage. And to some degree, everybody's competing on how do I upskill myself to stay relevant. Mm -hmm. And just to some degree, it does provide a little bit of an equalization uh, in terms of the amount that everybody has to do to, to, to stay a lifelong learner and stay current. But also the, the access to education is also now becoming much more equalized. And so whether it's a degree or whether it's just a free course, um, the availability is huge, and I, I think it really could help reduce some of the income and, uh, and other economic uh, inequality that's in the world today. Mm -hmm. Can I just add to that? I think Coursera um, is providing a, 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 another service that's really, really important, which is that, and you could speak to this too maybe, um, when refugees come to our country or come to Europe or, or flee their country, they often don't have time to go and get their their um, degrees yeah. and get the certification from their college or university, which was just blown up. You know, there's no record out there at all of what they've accomplished. So if you can go to Coursera and take courses, then you can reestablish your sort of certification mm -hmm. for a BA or an MA or what it, or an MBA or whatever it is you've done, and that could really um, be transformative. I, I don't know if either of you would like to address that. And yeah. It's real challenge, especially we see it, uh, we have another program is the burn children that we bring, and here's a, a child with the mother, you wanna bring them in, there's no birth certificate, there's no passport, no ID, nothing. So um, thanks to the State Department, we worked program with them where uh, they provide us uh, a visa without a passport. So once they come in here, they will start from scratch the paperwork. Um, so we start, for instance, most of them come from Turkey. I'm just using it as an example. So we start with the Turkish government to uh, create some sort of a travel document from nothing, from scratch. And then that travel document goes into the U.S. consulate in Istanbul to get a visa. Then we bring them in here. Now, once the treatment is done and they want to return, we have to start another paperwork for them. We go to the consulate in Houston, a Turkish consulate in Houston. We start a, a, a new paperwork so they can re-enter Turkey to go to Syria. Um, so that is just in a very simple humanitarian issue that you want to uh, treat a child. So how would you imagine when you have a refugee comes as a family and they need to get uh, an apartment, forget about even the paperwork, there's no credit at all. Mm. So it's really a real crisis. So that's where the community jump in to help them out and uh, try to uh, work uh, some deal with the, either the apartment, what have you, just to get them situated. And then we have to start uh, some sort of a, 
uh, paperwork with some other organization that are based in Turkey and they have access to the area that is controlled, let's say, by the um, liberated area, so to speak, where they can start create a document for them. Uh, and then we have to do the translation, bring them here and get them start, you know, getting into their, let's say, driver license, etc. It's really long process and uh, very frustrating because uh, simply they have no paperwork other than what they receive from the UN to come in here. But that's really not a basis. Um, so that is really an ongoing uh, challenge that we face. Once they're situated, then things start, you know, easing up. You know, they get the cars. Thank the community were very generous. They donated like over uh, 3,000 cars. And we start uh, prepare them to enter the market. But the first six months to a year is really just waste of time, mm -hmm. just trying to mm -hmm. kind of get them in shape to, to start their life. And we're not even touching on the health insurance, et cetera. And most family that they come here are number around seven uh, members. So that's not really a small uh, family. And then you have to bring the children and get them into school. So it's um, one thing I can say that our government truly failed to bring them here and, and do uh, some, have some f uh, facilities that can help them out. The burden truly came all on the community all of a sudden, just like a, a drop in a parachute, and now you have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I keenly sympathize, but at the same time, the U.S. government, um, uh, certainly previously, had, has, has had a very strong record in resettling refugees, and, and they, they do force the refugees to stand on their feet um, very quickly, but the results have actually been uh, very good in the long run, and mm. it, it actually, the refugee resettlement program was historically a point of bipartisan pride and something which the U.S. government did, did better working with uh, uh, non-profit resettlement agencies um, that, that, that now I think is, is, is under acute threat. But mm -hmm. uh, wh 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 while it certainly uh, uh, I think does does feel like like there wasn't enough support, I think that that's, that was partly partly by design to to really uh, push push refugees to be as self-reliant as quickly mm -hmm. as, as quickly as possible. Just, just one one quick point. Um, I'm I'm just emphasizing on the Syrian refugee. If you take what the Syrian refugee get assistance from our government, compare it with the Iraqi that was on long. I mean, it's not uh, too many years uh, before the Iraqi refugee. It's a day and night. Mm. You know, uh, they get very small amount of money to live uh, for their month. I think allowance around seven, eight hundred dollars. Um, I'm, I'm not very specific into the details in terms of size of family, etc. But uh, most of it goes into rent because they don't have a credit, mm. and therefore the rent will be substantially higher than anybody else goes to rent. So imagine refugee with all this crisis, they have to pay f far more uh, for, for housing than a regular person. I mean, these are really uh, a very small detail, but, and it goes on and on. Without the community, without local mosques and churches, it would have been a truly disaster. Mm -hmm. You would see them maybe on the street um, as a homeless. In a few minutes, I'm gonna open it up to the room for questions, so be prepared. Um, Harry, if you had, you know, two minutes to talk to every single leader at this conference about this issue, what, I mean, what would you want them to know? What would you want their takeaway to be about it? Um, on the refugee issue? Yeah. Um, I would say uh, invest, invest in refugees. Yeah. Um, invest the, in, uh, across the board. That's helpful to your businesses. It's, um, it enhances our country, it enhances our leadership around the world, and uh, it's the right thing to do. People are suffering, mm. and um, we need to step up. Mm. We have the resources, we have the power, we can do it, mm. and your leadership is important. Mm -hmm. What about you, Gideon? So I would say that, I mean, literally every major business uh, has an opportunity to help refugees in some ways, given its operations. And that's that, uh, what exactly that looks like to, uh, changes depending on whether you're, you're Coursera or Microsoft or Starbucks. But literally every business has the opportunity, uh, whether it's through investing or whether it's through making sure its goods and services reach refugees, whether it's through hiring or whether it's through managing its suppliers and vendors, which in today's economy literally touch every country. There are significant ways that literally every business can can make sure that it is it is 
bringing refugees in places like Bangladesh and uh, Turkey and Jordan into the global economy. So, so it's not for lack of opportunity. And at the same time, there is both a compelling humanitarian motive and, and business motive to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, what I say is we are a nation um, of people that always giving and generous. And we need to uh, treat the refugee crisis on the local level. So we need to reach out to our churches, welcome them home, and uh, uh, try to look at them as their human being. They, they carry so much burden. They did not come here because they wanted to come to America, but they were forced out of their home. And those people who are willing to go through the difficulty, some of them, not some, actually big portion of them swam uh, through the ocean uh, going to Europe, and many die along those way. Uh, so those people, they have a lot uh, of a drive that they want to make it in life. And that drive will contribute positive way to our life here in our economy. So we need to look at them as a human being, a brother and sister, and welcome them in our society. And if we work this on the local level, then you know, they can move up into the society and we, we will eliminate any, any of the political uh, slogan uh, to create hatred or, or, or negativity toward the refugee. Mm -hmm. Jeff, as a private sector leader who is investing in refugees, what would you want the leaders at this conference to Well, know? I just, I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, what, what, what do businesses need in the future? I mean, I, I think there's a big humanitarian reason to do this, but I think also <laughs> a pragmatic reason to say, what kind of talent do you need? Mm. What kind of skills do you need? You know, there's a cl cliche, but I love it, that, that talent is evenly distributed, but opportunity is not. Well, in a world where everyone can learn and you can do jobs remotely, um, you have a world of talent out there, mm. and, and especially those who evidence a, a, a toughness, a willingness to learn, an ability to stick with something. I, I think that we've heard a lot about sort of that learning mindset and that willingness to really work hard and stick, stick to something. And so I think trying to get beyond certain biases and prejudices to think about where's the best talent gonna come from, um, I think says that there's a lot of opportunity among refugees in many places where you wouldn't, you wouldn't commonly look. Great. I want to make sure we have time for questions. I have one in the back first. His hand was up first. Hey, good afternoon, guys, and uh, thank you. I, I really appreciate you guys uh, involving the question of history and politics into it because it's still happening, and you know there's a lot of proxy wars going on in that territory. So it's good to hear history and politics from different perspectives because you know that's the mosaic of reality. And secondly. I think that it's important to uh, look at the best practices from previous wars, previous uh, uh, success stories like here in LA, Homeboy Industries and Father Greg Boyle, what he's doing with uh, uh, getting jobs for former gang members and uh, you know, recovering addicts. And lastly, you know, there's, I think, uh, great ideas that like Homeboy Industries or what Pope Francis did, uh, you know, throwing out the idea of underutilized convents and other, mm. other buildings being used. Like sometimes with the right connection, those things become economically viable. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Uh, no, I just wanted okay. to <laughs> just wanted to see if you guys had done a little contrast and compare with you know previous uh, refugee cycles. You know, starting with Korea War. You know, you have a lot of people going to South America and so forth. Uh, are you guys seeing some best practices? You know, to call it something that can be applied. So, so certainly, um. Uh, W with respect to the uh, economic contribution that refugees have made in those past waves, there is there is strong evidence about that and uh, the tremendously positive contributions, whether it's uh, Hungarian refugees in the 1950s, uh, uh, the founder of Intel was Hungarian, whether it's Vietnamese refugees in the 1970s, whether it's Soviet refugees in the early 1990s. In each of those waves, economists have measured uh, there is significant economic contributions um, as a result of those. So, so with respect to the economic impact, it's, it's, it's resoundingly positive. Mm. In the front, over here. And, um, and I just add, there, there, is, uh, uh, there have been many studies on best practices and in, in how to integrate refugees into societies, and I think that there's um, been an expansion of that because of the waves that have come into Europe uh, over the last few years. So um, you're right that we should be looking at them, and they do exist. <laughs> so, and we love Greg Boyle. 
needs to hear. I was wondering uh, what you think about the efforts to use blockchain to restore the identity of refugees? Mm. Anyone working on that, blockchain? Well, I'm, we're not working on it, but I was just in Zatari refugee camp, which is in Jordan. It's on the Syria border with Jordan, and it's unbelievable. It's 83,000 people, and um, there is no, but not a single person lived there six years ago. It's the fourth largest city in the country of Jordan. And almost all the households are single parent or child-led households. And they're doing two things that are really amazing. One is all their identities are by um, their, their uh, iris identif identification, which is amazing, you know, so cutting edge. And they have no money. They're, it's all, everything that they buy is with blockchain. Wow, so it's so cool. You go, I went to the grocery store there, and there were all these with your people. Eyes? And <laughs> you don't pay with your eyes. And blink. <laughs> Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, really incredible. And they get paid through the, uh, this way as well. Wow. Yeah. So it's 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 really That's cool. Yeah. You want to say something? Well, you just to say, I mean, clearly, clearly there is a there is a need in terms of refugees uh, losing their identity documents, and and blockchain is sort of one solution to that. I think there is sometimes a temptation to only look for high tech solutions when when there's also a variety of low tech solutions to that problem. So it's promising, but but there's also lots of other ways that we can bring refugees into the economy, and banking services and other services without without blockchain. Is there anything that's not going on the blockchain? I feel like every <laughs> panel I go to, it's like, <laughs> what about this? But the blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> Here. Hi, thank you. Um, a few uh, comments, questions. Um, one is, I think you're absolutely right about integration in the US and making people independent. I'm from the UK, and they take a very different approach. And our integration outcomes are far, far worse. So it's very welfare-driven. Um, they do get housing once they come. The only thing they're screened for is uh, there's normally vulnerability, and, um, and they're security-cleared refugees. They come as families. They're housed, but we make it so difficult for them to work. They have to learn English first, which you don't have to do in the US. And our outcomes are much worse. So, so I, I would absolutely concur with that. Um, so that was, that was one thing. Um, uh, I have a question for the panel. So it's, it's been a really interesting discussion on what happens here in the UK and in the US. But the numbers coming to the UK and the US and, and, and Europe are tiny. Yeah. Um, you know, we mentioned over 20 million. There's about 65 million forcibly displaced. And a lot of overlap as to, you know, who who, sh who gets refugee sort of status, et cetera. Um, and so my question really is, what about doing, how can we do more in countries, host countries, and, and, and where there are forcibly displaced and, and refugees to actually, so they don't have to have these terrible journeys. They don't have to sort of drown in the waters and come up through the Sahel Desert. Uh, so I was in Uganda last week uh, in the Bidi Bidi camp, refugee camp. It's the biggest camp in the world. There was nobody there in 2016. It's now 287,000 wow. uh, people. Also mostly women and children, 83% women and children, because the men have either died or they're mm. fighting or they're in Juba, mostly South Sudanese. Um, and I saw some incredible efforts to try um, mm. and use agriculture uh, to actually make them not just self-sufficient, but connect them to agribusinesses to actually get them better inputs and pr improve. Um, so they could really create sustainable livelihoods. Education was a real problem. Uh, there, are, there was mm. one school, there were 14,000 kids in one school, mm. only for primary rotating around because there was only a few hours, no secondary uh, school at all. Um, so the question... So my, my yeah. question is, how do you collectively combine the private sector and education that you're doing? So for example, technology, but there's no power there. So how can we use it, technology? Mm. And how do you, would you collectively put your heads together, not just for how do we better um, uh, re resettle in, in the sort of global north, but how do we address things at source yep. so that we stem the flows? Thanks. Sure, I'm happy to jump in on that. Uh, I mean, the f first, completely agree that the vast majority of refugees uh, uh, are are in developing countries. The good news is is that a huge number of them are are in countries that are very very plugged into the global economy. So it is harder for the multinational business community to reach the Democratic Republic of Congo, but there's a huge amount of business that they do in Turkey, in Bang Bangladesh, in Ethiopia, in Jordan, in Kenya, whether it's direct employment or sourcing. Uh, 
pretty much most clothing comes from one of those countries I just mentioned. So there's huge opportunities for, for multinational, multinational businesses that are motivated, whether it's through hiring or through supply chains or through delivering services to reach, reach those populations. Uh, it's not going to reach uh, every country, uh, but I think uh, there's, a, there's a critical mass that the multinational, that, that the major businesses can reach. Mm. Up front. So I have a question about um, policy. You, we mentioned Starbucks. We can support them. We can support the companies that are, you know, employing re refugees. Are there any policies? We know, you know, the, this big push for the wall and this anti-Muslim ban. Um, what are there any policies that you're hearing that are coming down the pike in the next year that we can be putting pressure on our our government leaders, whether locally or nationally, that that you that we can go to the polls about or go, you know. To, to protest or whatever to get involved because that also, you know, money talks, but also we need to be putting pressure on our politicians yeah. to do something as well. Um, and that's, I kind of feel that I want to take action that way. And I'm curious to hear what you guys have to say about that. Sure. Yeah. Happy to jump in on that. Um, I mean, I think the single biggest issue in the refugee situation is uh, the U.S. resettlement program. Uh, uh, now, now, it's never been a panacea, and even under the Obama administration, it was, uh, this, you know, it reached as high as 100,000 out of 22 million. That was never going to solve the world refugee crisis. But the fact that uh, it has now been gutted, uh, the ceiling uh, was set at 45,000 for the year, it's going to reach a small fraction of that. That's incredibly important symbolic symbolically. Um, uh, there's clearly a, a, you know, a, a large number of refugees that are directly helped, but it also sends a signal to, to the countries that are hosting three or four million refugees that the United States stands in solidarity. It sends a welcoming message. So that is a very tangible thing that has outside symbolic significance uh, that I think uh, has been a very clear, explicit policy decision uh, and that uh, people, people can, can really look to and decide how they want to vote on that. Mm. Good time for one more, maybe. I don't want to decide. <laughs> Maybe we can get both. Yeah. All right. Is this on? It's on. Um, hi. Uh, John Kluge from the Light Fund. Um, I think that you know, uh, there was a woman up front who asked about policies that, that we could support uh, over the next year. Um, one quick point is that the BUILD Act is going through Congress to restructure OPIC. Um, if we're talking about the fact that most refugees are overseas in developing countries, the more resources we can actually get into those economies, the better. It's better for those host countries to take some of that pressure off, and it's better for the refugees if they can access those funds. Capital speaks volume. Capital is the economic leverage that allows for policy change. So my question to the panelists is, if we are here at the Milken Institute, and the Milken Institute is thinking about forced migration and refugee issues, it is a very financially focused community. What can we collectively ask of the Milken Institute and its community um, to do over the next 12 months to get more involved or to participate in solutions for this issue. Thank you. Tackle up to tackle access to capital and investment. Yeah. Sure. Um, I, I think it's a bit of a loaded question because J John is actually uh, uh, really driving some of the efforts uh, to to think about uh, how to how to. Uh, uh, um, uh, generate capital and drive it and crowd it in, into refugee hosting countries. Uh, I, I think it's a huge part of the solution, um, w whether that is uh, uh, identifying refugee-owned businesses and, and highlighting the fact that they, that they are um, more entrepreneurial than average and, and, and uh, uh, providing funding to those refugee-owned businesses, or, or in many cases m making a deal with um, uh, businesses and host communities, Jordanian businesses that are looking to grow and are willing to hire refugees as part of the you know, arrangement to get capital. I think there's a huge opportunity, uh, and if, uh, if investors are, are, are willing to be patient and maybe take slightly, slightly lower returns uh, in exchange for actually having a very significant social impact, I think there's a huge opportunity. Uh, th there's work to be done to build the pipeline, as, as, as John well knows, but I think there is a huge opportunity for, for investors to make an impact. Another thing to consider is that capital usually follows returns. You know, whatever the, uh, an efficient risk-adjusted return might be, and thinking a step ahead of it would be, how can you invest in human capital? I, I mean, of course, I'm going to be biased with an education slant, but many countries are realizing because of population and shifts in, in their economies that upskilling their populations is a really important part of the stability of their governments and the economic prosperity of their people. Getting behind government-initiated uh, you know, education and workforce development programs, I think, is effective. And the, the means by which people can be skilled 
are so much more efficient than they have in the past. I mean, investing in last generations, you know, bricks and mortar infrastructure, I don't think we'll have nearly as good a return as actually providing some of the more digital educational opportunities to large populations. Also supporting the local organization uh, will be much faster and because they understand the problem of this particular ethnicity where the refugee is coming from. And always there is a shortage of fund and skills. So if the institute with you know, its uh, great caliber of, of exposure to capital and uh, decision making um, anywhere, they can play a major role in supporting the local uh, organizations and identifying that need for particular refugee ethnicity. And that would be much faster in order to prepare those refugee how they can stand on their feet. And I would just add to that uh, support for the UN because mm -hmm. the, the UN is leading the world mm -hmm. as always on uh, refugee issues and the US uh, under this administration is undermining the UN again and again and again, especially on refugee issues. And we've just pulled out of the 2016 compact on, on refugees. So we should try and address that as part of the package. And I think that we are going to have to call it there. Thank you so much to my panelists for a great discussion. Um, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you.